Today, uh, if, you're right, if you like topics, uh, titles, this is the title. Uh, you, other than, I could say this is the title, Basic Christianity 101, but uh, actually the title is going to be Revealing the Father, and I want to talk about that. Also, wanted, we want to deal with the, the concept of Christ being in us. That's another aspect, and I want to begin this morning as we're here today, and I want to say welcome to all those who are uh, joining us this Sabbath uh, out there on the, the webcast. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we appreciate everybody. Uh, I know I get a, Kim gives me a copy uh, every time that I'm speaking of everything that y'all are saying, you know, on the chat. So uh, anyway, that's, that's always good to, uh, to see how that's going. But I'd like to begin the message this morning with a quote. And then you can tell me what you think about it, see what you think. This is the quote, you are called not so much to do great things as to be a great person. And that person is Jesus Christ. What do you think about that? Tall order? But we are not called so much to do great things as to be a great person, and that person is Jesus Christ. If we could really... If we, you know, I want, uh, hope today that this will cause us to uh, maybe jumpstart that thought process uh, in our in our daily lives and everything that we do, because it really is a truth. It really is right. And if we, when we can recognize that, and when we fully grasp that and put it into practice, uh, this would probably be a, a twin sermon to yours, Charles, sermon you had on ministry of presence, along the same lines. But if we could just really grasp this, uh, how it could transform, I think, our lives and the lives of those that we have influence uh, with and those that we, ha we have influence um, over. You know, and we all have influence with somebody. And many of us have influence with more than one somebody. Many of us, of us have influence with, with others. But, and to go along with this, I ask this question, where, where is your God located? Where is your God located? I mean, is he out there? Now, obviously, we, fit, we know that God exists out there, surely. He does. But what, is it, what does it mean by the scripture, Christ in us, the hope of glory? Christ in us, in us, the hope of glory. And so let's think about that. But turn on with me over here to Colossians chapter 1 to begin with as we... As we start thinking about the subject of revealing the Father and Christ being in us and um, the concept of we're called to be a great person, and that person is Jesus Christ. But in Colossians 1, I want to start reading in verse 23 and read through verse 27 to begin with. Verse 23, this is Colossians chapter 1, says, If indeed you continue in the faith, Firmly established and steadfast. Uh, I'm reading from NASB, so if you're in New King James or King James, just that's just so you'll know. But if you continue in the faith, fir firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, talking about the body of Christ, which is the church, in filling up uh, what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. And this, and that is, the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but now has been made manifest to his saints. Isn't that pretty awesome? Things that have been hid for, from generations are now made manifest to us, his saints. We have access, our eyes are opened. We pro, uh, <clears throat> his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of his glory, of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, and here's that statement, Christ in you, 
the hope of glory. And I'd like to now tell, you know, thinking about that, what is, I want us to think about what is the full magnitude, what is the, the real ramification of what it means to have Christ in us? What is that? You know, that's a pretty, uh, it's a tall order for us to uh, be like him, but he has empowered us with his spirit, and he is in us through that spirit that we might be like him and that we might be like the Father. So, how does that get done? Well, I want to read a story uh, to begin with this. Uh, to begin with this. It says, One day a, a church pastor invited a young trainee to join him on a trip into town to preach. And the young man was so honored that he quickly accepted, and all day uh, long they walked around the streets and rubbed shoulders and visited with hundreds of people. At the end of, of the day, they headed back home. However... Not even once had the pastor talked to anyone about the gospel. And the young man, the young trainee, was disappointed. And he said to the pastor, he says, I thought we were going to town to preach. To which the pastor replied, my son, we have preached. We were preaching while we were walking. We were seen by many and our behavior was closely monitored. It is of no use to walk anywhere to preach unless we preach everywhere we walk. And I thought, wow, that, is, that's, that hits home. That hits home. That we preach everywhere we walk. That we are seen and observed. So I want to talk about that, think about that principle of uh, how we are to let our light shine and how Christ in us is supposed to be exhibited. And uh how magnificent it is that we have this calling and this opportunity. And I, I want to give just a, a brief overview of, of things. I hope you'll um, bear with me in this for just a minute. Because I've always thought that it has been God's, of course, we know what the Scripture says in Corinthians chapter 6 in Revelation 21, that he will walk in us and dwell in us. He's going to be with us. Don't you think that was always in his intent from the very beginning, that he walk in and dwell with his people? I certainly think so, because in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, if we go back to that, God created everything that exists, and we know that after each of the, uh, those things came into existence, how does the verses always end? And it was good. God saw that it was good. And mankind was his masterpiece. You think about that. We created in his image. And we know what it says in Genesis 1.26 that says, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness and after our likeness. And guess what? You think about that for a minute. Are those, is that one thing or two? Because I believe it's two, two things being mentioned there. There is to be in the image, which is to look like, and then there's, or, you know, and then there is likeness, which is to be alike in character, in uh, thought in direction in everything that's done and I believe that's the intent that God had from the very beginning that he walk in and dwell in us and that we be like-minded one together and that we be together but we know what happened don't we there there was sin that entered and man's fall you know we know that 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 happened and we know that even before that he walked in the garden and he talked with them he, there was instruction going on he walked with Adam and Eve you know he was he was with them and I, I'm sure he loved it I'm sure it was a uh, was wonderful but then we know that man Adam and Eve there was disobedience that took place and sim Satan put forth temptations that like he does now to all of us and and there was uh, a a divergence of paths that took place. And because of that, we read over in Genesis chapter 3, in Genesis chapter 3, that God said this in verse 20. It says, Now the man called his wife, uh, the name of his wife Eve, and she became, I want to make sure I'm in the right place, she was the mother of all the living, and the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And then the Lord said in verse 22, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. We know that that was not what the intent was. It was, take the tree of life. 
not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's it. Whatever, whatever that all, you know, that concept, that thought, how that took place, you know, we, we read the story of it being an apple. And whether it was an apple or if there was more to this or not, we don't know. But we know this, that man fell and that there was sin entered in. And that, it says man became like us, knowing good and evil. And now, <clears throat> and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. And so he drove man out of, we know that, out of the east, uh, east of the Garden of Eden. And, you know, they put the Caribbean there with the flaming sword that turned every way to protect the way to the tree of life. And there became a separation. You know, God wasn't walking with his people. He wasn't dwelling in them. And we realize and we recognize that. And then we know, then we know throughout the rest of the Old Testament, and by the way, we are all, we're also aware of the fact that God knew this was going to happen that uh, they had, you know, from the plan, from the foundation of the world, that Jesus would have to come and be the sacrifice for us. I mean, I, uh, I think obviously he knew that there was going to be uh, something along the way that would cause there to be the sin, and that sin would enter in. But then we read throughout the rest of the, uh, you know, of the, of the Old Testament, we read of all of these prophecies and the major prophets and the minor prophets about the one who was to come, the Savior. And, you know, in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and in all the minor prophets, there's, there's many, many prophecies. We're going to read one in a little bit. Anyway, we come through that period of time, there's all the prophecies given, and then we come to the time that Jesus comes on the scene. That's a lot of years from the garden to Jesus coming on the scene. That's a lot of years. And we come all the way to that time, and we learn, you know, you can read this in John and Matthew, several different places, that he, Jesus made this statement. He says, I've come to reveal the Father. You know, I've, I've always wondered what that meant. What does that mean? God's always been around. Why would he have to reveal him, right? Uh, and so, and then Jesus made statements like this. He would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are alike. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So I realized that when Jesus was on the scene, he was revealing the Father. He was revealing the character, the love, and the way God was. Because if we read and recognize what Jesus was, we're knowing and seeing that so was the Father. They were one, and they were, in this, they were the same. And so he said, you know, he came to reveal the Father. And Jesus began revealing to mankind what God was like. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, John 14 says, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, John 12 says, and he that sees me sees him that sent me. And John 10 and verse 30 says, I and the Father are one. They were alike. So we began to say, you know, all of us over these years, as we've been called and as we've come to understand and comprehend <gasps> truth and understand character and we understand what Jesus was willing to do for us and his love and his, the, uh, the way he came and served and laid down his life, that it's the way the Father is. They're one. They're the same. And then we're told in Philippians 2.5, it says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, that we be the same way. And so then we read Jesus arrives on the scene, and we know that um, you know, we've, we're all familiar with scriptures that, you know, as he was growing up and uh, the, the things that took place, but... Then we read over here in Luke something, Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, and while you're turning to Luke chapter 4, you might also keep uh, Isaiah 61 handy, because I'll be reading from them too. But in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 15, talking about Jesus, says, he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. Jesus began his ministry. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, as was his custom. He entered in on the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it is written. And then if you would, turn to Isaiah 61, because we'll read that. We're going to read like he was reading. 
he opened up the scroll and he read out of Isaiah 61. And Isaiah 61 and verse 1. We read this because this was the ministry that Jesus Christ came to perform. This was what he came to do. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring, to, to bring good news to the afflicted. And that, in my margin, says to the humble. King James reads it a little bit differently, doesn't it? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And then if you would go back to Luke chapter 4, To, to proclaim, verse 19 says, the acceptable, uh, the favorable year of the Lord of the acceptable year. And he closed the book. And he sat down and he said, now is this fulfilled in your ears? And he began his ministry. And his ministry also is talked about in the book of Acts, chapter 10. And, of course, we're very familiar with, and there's no way that... Uh, I am taking the time to go over everything that Jesus Christ ever did in his ministry. But in summary, we read this in chapter 10, in verse 38 of Acts. that says, For you know of Jesus Christ how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. You know, and that's part of, uh, of what he had read over there in Isaiah you know, relieving those that were afflicted. And we are witnesses of all the things that he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, and that they also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. And so, you know, we, we recognize and we see what it was. And we're told, let this mind be in you. And Jesus said, I didn't come to serve, but he, you know, to, to be served. He says, I came to serve others. We know that scripture. We're familiar with it. And everywhere he went, it was almost like he was asking this, is there anything I can do to help you? In fact, I want to read two places where he basically said that. Uh, one is in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20 and verse 30, uh, let's see, leaving, beginning here in verse 29. Matthew 20, it says, and they were... As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. And that was certainly typical. And two blind men were sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by. And he, uh, hearing that Jesus was passing by, he cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the crowd sternly told them to be quiet. But they cried out <laughs> all the more. You know, louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? What would you have me do for you? And they said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. And look at, look at this, moved with compassion. Moved with compassion. He's compassionate. If he's compassionate, who else is compassionate? The Father. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they gained their sight and followed him. And then over in Luke, if you would, Luke chapter 18. Luke 18. You know the scripture that says uh, of if the magnitude of the things of uh, what Jesus Christ did, there wouldn't be books to contain all that's written. You know, we're just hitting a couple of highlights because what he came to do and what he did, there's not enough volumes of books to contain all the good that he did. But in verse 41 of Luke 18, 
Um, actually, this is, uh, I, I want to begin here in 35. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now, hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. And they told him that the Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And calling out, he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, honestly, this could be the same story, just told differently, but one by Luke and one by Matthew. Similar, they're similar, obviously. And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. Shh, shh, be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? What can I do for you? And, Jesus, and he said, Lord, Lord, I want, to re, I want to be able to see again. I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you whole. And immediately he regained his sight, and he began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Can you imagine that sight? How awesome that would have been. How awesome that, was, that would have been. And then Jesus made a very, you know, he goes to, his ministry is, is continuing on. As I said, there's not volumes of books that can contain all the things that Jesus did. And then Jesus says a most shocking statement. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is needful that I go away. What? <laughs> it can't get any better than this. <laughs> People are being healed. People, you know, there's, people are coming to you know, know you and know why you're here. Sins are being forgiven. What do you mean by that? Well, he said, if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send it to you. He sent his Holy Spirit. And we know that on Acts, in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost... The Spirit of Rock came, didn't it? Descended on all of those who were there. And you and I understand the things of God and comprehend the great and wonderful things that He, some of the wonderful things that He's doing and some of the wonderful things He's planning. Not that we have full understanding, because we certainly don't, but, but we have His Spirit by which we can understand and comprehend. That Spirit that is in us, dwelling in us. That was the Spirit that Jesus was talk, had been talking about. And so, you know, I kind of summarize it this way. In the Old Testament, after the fall of man, God was out there. But you know what? There wasn't a whole lot of contact, was there, over, over all those years? I mean, there was a few people that were directly dealt with. We can know Abraham, right? Sarah. We know Moses. There's, there's, there's several instances where he was there and with them. Then when we get to the New Testament, it's completely different. It's Emmanuel, God with us. But what is it now? Now, for us, it's Christ in you. Christ in us. Not only is he present and here, but he's in us through His Spirit. I make that delineation because I think it's a real important one for us to, to comprehend and, and get a, a hold of and grasp because of the power that we have through His Spirit that's in us. We don't recognize, I don't think, the power that goes with it and the, mighty, the, the incredible things that His Spirit does. It changes us. If we allow Him to work in us, then we can become like Him which is the intent from the very beginning, to be in His very image and in His very likeness. And we know Romans 8, if you'll turn with me to Romans 8. And just notice in the next few uh, scriptures, the phrasing of these words, the phrasing of the way this is put. But in Romans 8, in verse 8, and I want to read through verse 11, it says, And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. When we're not walking in the Spirit and when the Spirit is not leading, when we're walking in the flesh, that doesn't please God. However, you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. 
But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And we know that's a, you know, baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit, having the hands laid on, is a wonderful experience. It's the beginning point. How many of you remember the beginning point of your baptism? You remember that? All this time, God's been walking with us, and His Spirit's been in us. I ask this question. When people see us, do they see the Father? When people see you, do they see Christ? If Christ, verse 10 says, well, I'm going to read 9 again. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. And that's a statement. The body, though the body is dead. But if the Spirit of Him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit which dwells in you. Christ in us will allow that to happen. His Spirit dwelling in us. And I won't turn there. I'm going to refer you to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, that talks about the, that there is the things of man, the things of God, we can't know. We can't comprehend. We can't understand the things of God except by His Spirit that dwells in us. It is what allows us to, you know, the light bulb to go, dee -dee, oh. And we begin to understand and we begin to comprehend because of His Spirit that dwells in us and how wonderful it is that we have it have that and then it's turned to if you would to first peter or i'm sorry second peter chapter one christ in us the hope of glory in second peter chapter one and we we could spend out maybe this is a good assignment for us to read uh, in entirety maybe this section of scripture because it's really powerful uh, because really it's if we want to be successful as Christians here's the formula <laughs> because it says if these things be in you and abounding you shall never fail but in verse 3 says seeing that his divine power has granted unto us everything pertaining to life and godliness so we can, we're not godly of, of our own godliness doesn't happen because of us does it it happens because of what his spirit that dwells in us and that we submit to him through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these things he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. How much of that divine nature floats our boat how much of that divine nature directs everything we do every day and because of that divine nature when people see us do they see god do they see jesus christ how much of that how much influence you know i think about what we read there in isaiah 61 the spirit of the lord is upon me you know to, to help those that are sick, to relieve people that are... Can we do good things like that? Can we re relieve people that are afflicted? You know, I wait for the time when we as God's people can, can do things like Peter and John did at the Temple Beautiful when, you know, there was the beggar there and, and he, you know, said, alms. And Peter says, gold and silver I have not, but what I have I give to you. Grabbed him and said, take up your bed and walk. And he was healed. I look forward to that time when, when we're able to do that. But you know, that doesn't negate what we can do now. And what do people see when they see us? What revealing? Now, you know, there's... Be, be honest. I'll, I'm going to be honest. 
Have there been moments in your life, like there have been moments in my life when I have not revealed the Father? Yeah. What I really pray for in those, in those moments when I have done things that, you know, and said things and had an attitude about things and, you know, ready to dot somebody's eye, you know, ready to fight at a drop of a hat, that what I pray is that that would not have deterred them from the things of Christ in the long run. That my, my bad conduct, because, you know, it's going to be one way or the other. Either we're going to display and reveal the Father and the Son, or we're going to reveal that which, you know, isn't, isn't good. But he goes on, he says, Now for this very reason, verse 5, also applying all diligence... He gives us some things to, uh, you know, homework here, things that we need to have. That if we have these in us, this is going to be revealing the things of God. This is the character of Jesus Christ. This is the Spirit of God in us that works, that allows all of the, mira the miraculous things to take place that Christ was and that He said and that He did. You know, faith and moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness. And then verse 8 says, For if these qualities are yours and in, are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, how are, these, how are we doing with these things? But notice these things that are in us, these are the qualities that are of Christ that are in us and need to be in us. He's granted us His Spirit so that these things can be done. A couple of points from Acts chapter 2 uh, on the day of Pentecost. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Anybody ever remember the Eldad, Medad story back in the Old Testament? Remember that was the story where Jethro had told Moses, you need to appoint 70 to help you because this the ta you know the burden of, of all of that you're trying to do is too much so di divide it out so 70 were chosen well in this particular instance so there was there was 68 of them were up with Moses and there was two of them that were out in the camp and they you know they're prophesying Eldad and Medad and uh, somehow Joshua didn't think that was right and so you know he goes running up to Moses 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 in the camp two of them and they're prophesying Make them stop. <laughs> Make them come up to where you are. And Moses said, well, are you jealous for my sake? Oh, that all the children of Israel were prophets. And I mention that because sometimes we think we have to rely on the ministry for things. God has given you his spirit. Christ is in you. And then in Acts 2, Beginning in verse 16, it says, but, well, verse 14, Peter begins by saying, you know, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared unto them, men of Judea and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known unto you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you would suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. And then he says this, he says, but this, what you're seeing is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And in, it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit upon all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even my bond slaves, both men and women, I will be in those. I will in those days, excuse me, pour forth my spirit, and they shall, guess what? They shall prophesy. We, we really put a big, you know, what does that mean? Young men, old men, women, men, children, all prophesying? Well, if it's prophetic, it just simply means someone who sees and hears and speaks from God's perspective. Can't we all do that? Shouldn't we all do that? I believe that's what we will do for eternity. <laughs> 
and for all those that are ahead of, you know, in, in, that we will help in, in the future, is we will prophesy. We will speak on behalf of God, what his words say. And it, to be filled with the Spirit, and guess what? Ready to meet the needs of those around. Can't we do that? He will walk in us, and he will dwell in us. And then continuing reading here, it says in verse um, 19, I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. You think we're heading into some troubled times? I mean, we see how quickly things could escalate, potentially. We see all, uh, a, a lot of, a lo maybe Paul put it this way, aren't there some alarming things that we see out there? They are, they are kind of alarming to me. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, so this is describing systems and economics and governments and things falling apart. And certainly, you know, it's the signs of the last days, as Revelation says. Guess what? I believe people in the world are hurting. I believe people in the world are lost, <laughs> have lost their direction and focus. Where's the compass? There is no compass. It's, you know, what's happened? Kind of a sad, sad time. But guess what? We can help. We can help them. That's what we're supposed to do. All of us, we have the answers. We're learning the answers, and we can do it if we're bold enough to reveal the Father, reveal His character, reveal the way He is, that when they see us, people see you, they see the Father. It might happen when you're at work. It might happen by the way you slow down and let somebody merge in front of you instead of honking your horn at them. Maybe they got to get over into the, you know, lane. Might be going on a coffee break. Might be sharing a problem. You can tell somebody's upset. You know something is going on. Might be here. There might be some of our brothers and sisters that are suffering loss right now due to, you know, a husband or a wife passing away and dying. What can we do? We have the answers. If we will do it. If we would just say... What can I do for you? What can I do for you? And so, you were called not to do such, so much great things as to be a great person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And we are to radiate the Father and the Son everywhere we go. I want to read John 17, some verses, John chapter 17. I want to, I want to read verses beginning in verse 15. And we know that this is Jesus' prayer for his disciples. This was, we read, read this at Passover. And we know and recognize this was his prayer for the 12, specifically, for what they were going to be facing. But it was also a prayer for us because we, too, are his disciples. It's for us. This is for us. But in verse 15, he says, talking to the Father, Jesus says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. He doesn't want us away. He wants us to reveal him. We don't need to become isolationists. We need to show the world the way, the great things of God. Everything, you know, in our daily lives to the truth, to, you know, the, the principles we learn, you know. Mwah. The Bible principles are awesome. He says in verse 16, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As... And then notice these next few verses, because these are very powerful, very powerful. 
As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. And I do not ask on behalf of these alone, not just the twelve, but for those also who believe in me through their word. That that's us, isn't it? That they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Powerful words. Powerful words. That they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in, united, in unity. And that in one, that we may be perfect in one, in the Father and in the Son. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. I think it's a challenge. Too many, I think I issue this challenge that we not be like this, that too many have it backwards, I believe, that uh, they think it's all about, that we think sometimes it's all about us being blessed. You know, it's about us being blessed. But guess what? When, when truly we have been blessed, we're blessed so that we can be a blessing. And freely we have received, freely give. And we can do it if we're bold enough. So remember that story I was telling you about at the beginning about the pastor and the young trainee? Remember what, his, what the pastor told him? He says, my son, we have preached... We were preaching when we all, while we were walking. We were seen by many and our behavior was closely watched. It's of no use to walk anywhere to preach unless we preach everywhere we walk. It's a true statement. It's a true statement. The pastor had one other wise thing to say. The wise pastor also said, Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, sometimes use words. <laughs>